Good morning, everyone. Welcome to The Sci-Files, an impact exposure series focusing on student research here at Michigan State University. We're your co-hosts, Chelsea Boudou and Daniel Puentes. This summer, our theme is focusing on the relationship between graduate student mentors and their undergraduate student mentees. Mentoring is an important part of research and helps students develop into the scientists of today. Now we're joined by Courtney Larson and Katie Kurczynski. Katie, can you please introduce yourself a little for us? Um, I'm Katie Kurczynski. I'm a master's student here at Michigan State in the Fisheries and Wildlife Department. And I used to be an undergrad working with Courtney my senior year, uh, like way back 2016-2017. Nice. So then what is your research about? I am looking at the diets of fish in Lake Huron. So I'm looking at spatial patterns and temporal trends and what they're eating. So what kind of fish like lake trout or salmon are eating and when they eat it and where they're at when they eat those fish. How do you record that and measure it? So we go to fishing tournaments and we cut the stomachs out and then we bring them back to the lab. Uh, and Once we get them there, we cut the stomachs open and identify the fish based on external features if we can, so like coloration and everything. And if they're too digested, we'll look at some of the bones. So one of the really good bones we look at is called the calythra, and it's connected to the pectoral fin, and it's really good for identification because it's different between all the species. Are you looking at the fish that were digested by the bigger fish? Yes. Oh, okay, now I understand. How does the color matter? Um, so different fish look different. Um, so like uh, yellow perch has stripes or bars on its side, uh, and other fish don't necessarily have that. So if it's not super digested, we can still see that and just identify the fish based on what it looks like. Could you please elaborate what is the purpose of this research for me? So the DNR, or the Department of Natural Resources, makes models that kind of figure out how many prey fish the predators are eating. So like, are lake trout eating a bunch of alewife or a bunch of gobies, and how much of it are they eating? And a big part of that model requires data about what the fish are eating and how much they're eating, and that's kind of old data right now, so my project is updating that to better the models. That's interesting. You went from learning about streams and microorganisms with Courtney, and now you're working with lake and fish. How did you make that transition? So a lot of it is all community structure. So when I was working with Courtney, we were looking at how communities differed between different sites, and now I'm pretty much looking at how communities differ between different fish. We'll direct this question towards Courtney now. Courtney, what was Katie's role in your research on the shredders? So Katie played a really important role in my research when she first started helping me out with uh, my own identification of macroinvertebrates and participating in lab activities. And while we were discussing our research, we started bouncing off ideas and kind of being allowing that creative scientific process to happen um, and got interested in what some of the drivers of these differences in the shredders and other groups of invertebrates and streams are. So she developed her own project um, independently, which she actually applied and got funding for, which was really awesome, and could then go through that whole process of the field work. We were out in the stream together some days uh, the, the lab identification process, which was really long and tedious, but eventually got us to that final product of a conference presentation. Can you tell us a little bit about what that research consisted of, Katie? Yeah. So when I was working with Courtney, I was looking at differences in communities between sites and rivers that had fallen logs. So some of them had vines on them and some of them didn't. So I was comparing the two uh, ones with fallen logs that had vines versus the ones that did not have vines. It really made that much of a difference? Um, not so much, but it was something to look at. I think that's so pretty whenever I see fallen logs all the time. What kind of vines were you looking at? Was there a specific vine or was it just any kind of vine over there? Any kind of vine over there. It was, we were looking at how it added structural complexity to the sites. Would that be because it's adding like shade to it with how the canopy was over some streams? Shade, extra surface area on the log, things like that. Well, that actually makes me think more of how it adds more food supply for the shredders to actually consume while they're in the river whenever the 
plant material from the vines actually would fall off, but that it seems like it didn't add that much, did it? We didn't see many leaves on the vines, but we saw a lot of leaves like getting trapped on them um, when they would float downstream. Courtney had mentioned that you presented at a conference with her before. Did you guys get to publish anything together? We did not. I haven't quite finished the actual analysis on that data yet. I got kind of caught up. I got a job in Alaska the summer after that, and then I started grad school, so I haven't quite had a chance to finish that part of it. So it sounds like you've been all over the nation when it comes to performing this type of fisheries and wildlife research. Yes. And what, what what did you do over in Alaska? So when I was in Alaska, I was looking at the habitat use and abundance of juvenile salmon in glacial streams. So it was pretty cool. We got to go around and trap a bunch of salmon in little minnow traps and evaluate habitat. So we looked at like how much water was flowing through a site and different brush and pebble size and all sorts of stuff. That's wonderful. Was that through MSU or another program? That was... I was an intern for the Aquatic Restoration and Research Institute, which is a nonprofit based out of Talkeetna, Alaska. Cool. And where are you working with now? Are you at KBS or are you at MSU, um, the main campus? I'm at the main campus at MSU. But you have to travel to Lake Huron, right? Yep. So I would go all up and down the coast of Lake Huron trying to get to fishing tournaments. So there were fishing tournaments as far north as... Hessel, I didn't quite make it to that one. I went as far north as, I think, Charlevoix, and all the way down to Port Huron also. So we went all along the coast, just catching as many tournaments as we could. You had mentioned Charlevoix, but that's along the Lake oh, Michigan I meant side. Sheboygan. Oh. Yep, nope, oh. that was Sheboygan, not Charlevoix. Oh. People don't want the stomachs of the fish, I'm assuming. Like, are, do, when these fishing tournaments happen, do they just throw all the fish, like, to the side? Nope. So most people keep the fish, although quite a few are donated to charity. Um, but nobody uses the stomach for anything. It's not good for eating or anything like that. Usually it would just get thrown out. So we'll just ask if we can take the stomach either before or after they're done cleaning their fish. I would imagine that a lot of your research would take place in the summertime, but I wonder if you do any cross-reference studies by looking at how the trout ingest those smaller fish in the wintertime with ice fishing tournaments, for example? So there are a few ter- fishing tournaments in the winter, although there's not many. Um, and we didn't make, and we weren't able to get to any of the tournaments in the winter, but that's something we're looking at doing in the future. Um, but we just didn't get to it this past two years. What do you imagine would be the difference in the contents of a trout's stomach versus winter versus summer? I imagine we'd see a little bit of a difference in composition. We're seeing some seasonal trends right now. So like in the spring, we see a lot of round goby. And in the uh, summer and late fall, or and in the late summer and early fall, we see a switch to rainbow smelt. So I'd like, I'd probably expect to see that switch back to round goby. Um, It'd be really interesting to see when that switched though. And if there was anything else that we don't see commonly in the summer that they eat a lot more of in the winter. Do you happen to go along only Lake Huron, or do you happen to look at the streams that may come across Michigan to Lake Huron or something like that? So I'm just looking at fish that are in Lake Huron. You transitioned from a fisheries and wildlife internship in your undergraduate career to now you're doing a thesis on fisheries and wildlife. How did your undergraduate mentorship with Courtney affect your future? Like, Did you always feel like you wanted to go to grad school, or did that really solidify it for you? So I always kind of knew that I was going to go to grad school. Um, it was just one of those things that they're always telling you. You're not going to be able to get as good of a job or as permanent of a job if you don't go to grad school. Um, in my experience with Courtney, it really solidified the experimental and the research process in my mind. Um, I had done a couple projects and worked a, a couple of other labs before working with Courtney, but with her I really developed the whole project from start to finish um, and kind of felt more like I knew what I was doing and felt more prepared to go to grad school because of it. And Courtney, how did you guys come together to organize the project? Was Katie, one of your first mentees, or had you had experience before that? 
So Katie and I met while we were both taking the same course, aquatic entomology, taught by my advisor, Dr. Benbow. And that established a friendship and uh, just being able to talk passionately about how much we love aquatic organisms and how much we love aquatic insects. And so that friendship developed into a mentorship um, by, like I said, taking her to out to do field work and looking at samples and discussing potential research opportunities. And what was really awesome about this uh, opportunity with Katie is that it was the first time I had taken someone with me to a conference that was presenting work that I had helped them with. And that was one of the proudest moments I've had showing some of the um, professors that I knew from other institutions and see every year at the conference to say, you know, not only am I giving a talk, but someone who I mentored is giving a presentation. And that was great to see how supportive all those people were about me supporting someone else and kind of going to that next level of my career. Really? Really? Don't put me on the spot like that. <laughs> no, that's a great thing. Okay, cool. <laughs> Congrats. That's a really proud moment. Katie, have you ever felt that moment? Like, have you ever mentored someone now, too? Um, so I have begun to mentor a few people. Um, I had uh, seven was the most I had at a time working for me in my lab. I haven't been able to help anybody with a poster yet, but that's a next step for future me. It's been really cool to see um, some of the texts learn, though, from not being able to identify any fish to be able to finish 20 or 30 stomachs in a day. Um, so you can go from like doing one or two in eight hours to 20 or 30, and it's a really cool process to see. How many stomachs have you gone through in your whole dissertation or the whole thesis? My thesis is going to have over 3,000 stomachs in it. And there's, we're working on getting an, PhD student to continue working on this project and do both Lake Michigan and Lake Huron. So they're going to probably have six or 8,000 stomachs to go through. Where would you guys draw the line? Would it be like Mackinac Bridge? Because, you know, like the water is kind of intertwined. Yeah, I think that's where the line usually is. Um, One of the goals, as far as I know, of the PhD project is to look at Uh, the fish that are moving between Lake Huron and Michigan also and kind of see which ones are getting food out of Lake Michigan that are caught in Lake Huron and vice versa. What are you trying to answer with your research? So I'm looking at the temporal trends and the spatial patterns that are in the diets of the fish. So I'm looking at what they're eating and how it changes throughout the year. So I'm looking at months. We get most fish between April and October. So I'm going to be divvying them up into months. And we also look at uh, space. So we've got six statistical districts. So the first one is about Rogers City North. And then there's one between Rogers City and just south of Alpena. Um, The Oscoda area, Saginaw Bay, Harbor Beach area, and Port Huron. So we've got six statistical districts. And Courtney? Can you remind our audience what your research is about really quickly? My research is on how the invertebrates and microbes interact in decomposition of streams. And remember, those invertebrates are those uh, animals that don't have backbones, so things like aquatic insects. Really cool topics that you guys are both studying now. Do you ever see any chance of collaboration, or do you guys collaborate with other laboratories in your department? Well, I've been able to see Katie's research on full display on her lab's Instagram page, where she's actually posting pictures of the stomachs and what's found in them. And I've seen a couple macroinvertebrates in those pictures. And so I think there's definitely opportunity to collaborate uh, with those types of samples where there are invertebrates that the fish are consuming. I really wonder sometimes maybe what the the microbes and what macroinvertebrates are there. That would be a really interesting thing to look at. And what's the Instagram so people can follow? So the Instagram is Great Lakes Predator Diet, and the Facebook is Huron, Michigan Predator Diet Study. We'll make sure to put those in the biography of our podcast. 
Katie, you're currently in progress of completing your master's degree. Is there any interest in afterwards pursuing a doctoral degree? Um, so there's definitely potential for that. I do not know that I want to do that right away. Um, grad school is a lot, and I've been going to school nonstop pretty much since kindergarten. So I'm looking forward to at least a year break before looking at Ph.D. programs. What do you do over here at Michigan State University? Do you do any outreach, or are you in any organizations or anything? So I do do some outreach. I, In addition to the Facebook and Instagram page, I go to Citizens Fishery Advisory Meetings for Lake Huron. So that's where a lot of anglers and other angling groups go to see results or to see fishing data and fishing results and um, whatever other studies are being done by the DNR and other groups such as USGS or U.S. Geological Survey, who does a lot of research. Um, and they get to see what's going on and ask questions directly to the scientists. So I'll go there and present research there. Um, I've also done a couple of girl, women and girls in science events. Um, so I was on a panel in Gaylord, Michigan, which is where I was from a couple of weeks ago. Called It was an event called Tech Savvy. Um, and so I was up on a panel where a bunch of the girls who were middle school aged were able to ask questions to us and we could tell them um, whatever they wanted to know. Um, and I was also part of the Girls in Science event here on campus a couple months ago, um, helping one of my friends do a stock assessment uh, activity. So the girls got to estimate how many fish were in a box. They were fake fish, but. That's awesome. This question is for both you, Courtney, and Katie. Why do you think mentoring is important for women in STEM? So... When I, I've been to a few management meetings with the DNR, and one of the things I've noticed is the lack of female representation at these meetings. It's primarily men, and I think that um, younger girls able to see uh, other women in those roles will really help them get more excited and be like, yes, we can do that, and there is a possibility for us to work in these jobs even if it is primarily men right now. I'll add to that that sometimes it can be difficult to find mentors as a woman because a lot of the men in the sciences take on men as their mentors. And so as a woman in science, I think it's important to purposefully take underrepresented groups such as women and um, mentor those people who don't necessarily get those opportunities automatically. Absolutely. I would agree with everything that both of you have said. I think that we should make more of an effort to be able to fill the void of diversity in these different jobs by encouraging different uh, groups at young ages to then give them the experience and see that, yes, I can do this. And I think that's really important. Katie, you had mentioned that there was an Instagram account for your laboratory. What kind of things do you post on there? So we post a lot of pictures of the actual stomachs that we see and the different prey items we find in them. Sometimes we find cool hooks or bait that's used. Like we found some cooked shrimp and some steelhead. Um, so we'll post pictures of the cool stuff we find. Uh, every now and then we'll post pictures of the techs and what they've been doing and also... Uh, if you go way back towards the beginning, we had a whole overview of the process that we have. And so every, you can see step by step what we do when we get the stomachs into the lab. How often does your lab discover plastic in the stomach of these fishes? Not as often as I expected to. Um, we see it in a couple. We see hooks more than we see plastic. Uh, so kind of off the topic of plastic, but the coolest thing we've seen so far is a bird leg. And we took that to the ornithology lab here and found out it was a robin. So that was a really cool find. Uh, not what we expected, but it was pretty neat. Did the fish eat the robin or just happen to catch a wing? It was just the leg, so we don't know if it was 
the rest of it was like digested or if it just it bit off a piece of the leg or if the leg was all that was there. We're not entirely sure, but there's a lot of different options it could have been. <laughs> Maybe some sick fisherman was using it as bait. I mean, you never know. It's a nice drumstick. Yeah. No, okay. <laughs> Anyways, does everyone in your lab dissect the fish stomach or do people have different roles? Like, how do you guys define the roles of the mentors and the mentees in there? Because we had so many different stomachs to go through everybody's job was to process the stomach um in addition to that they also all entered data and checked the data to make sure it was entered properly but their primary role was to identify the contents of the diets what are some challenges that you guys face sometimes um having super digested fish makes it very difficult to identify um so sometimes we'll just have a couple of vertebrae and that's it and usually we can't identify those fish. So that's one of the big challenges. Um, and identifying the fish that are partially digested enough where we're still able to identify them, that's a huge learning curve. So the first month or two is usually pretty tricky um, when you first get started. But after that, you can just kind of go. Thank you so much for joining us, Katie. Good luck on your research and your master's. Next, we're going to have Michael Orbain join us, who is an undergraduate that works in Courtney's laboratory. Welcome, Michael. Hello. Thanks for joining us today. I was wondering, could you please tell us what is your research that you do at Courtney? Well, in Courtney's lab, I mainly just look at samples of leaf litter. At first, we take them out of the freezer with samples that she collected. And I look through them, mainly looking for macroinvertebrates that may be found in the river systems. And then once I find that, I separate the uh, leaf litter into like two different piles. One for like microprocessing litter. I'm not, I'm not really familiar on the whole process of that. And then the rest of it, we kind of, we like burn. I'm not exactly sure exactly what that has to do with the research, but... I do remember Courtney saying that she was playing with fire a while ago. Courtney, could you help explain to our listeners the parts that we're kind of confused about, please? So we take weights of these leaf litter because we want to know how much has been decomposing in the stream. So we take a weight before they get put in the stream, and then once they get taken out at different time points. And the thing about those weights is that we want to know what part of the leaves is this nice organic matter that the macroinvertebrates can consume and is active in the ecosystem. And so we burn it so that all of that nice organic material gets, uh, gets burned off and we can take the difference in those weights to determine the weight of the organic material versus the stuff that's not organic. That makes complete sense. Yes, so thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Michael, what motivated you to get involved with this research in particular? Well, I was actually in a Bio2 lab last semester, and my TA mentioned an opportunity about one of her friends working in a lab. And I actually really liked the TA. I thought she was very interesting. I liked her research with uh, polar bears in, uh, I think, Alaska, if I'm mistaken. But I remember emailing Courtney. I was like, I'd just be interested. I was looking at, they had like a kind of a website for Dr. Benbow's lab. And it just kind of was really interesting. I was, that semester I had taken a class on invertebrate biology. So when I was taking that class, I was just, a lot of the stuff like you just, you see about the critters all the time. And you just know about them now. It's just crazy. Like knowing like that ticks are arachnids or like daddy long leg spiders, like having like, it's like a weird like. Their eye sits on, like, a tubercle or something. It's, like, a weird, like, stand. I don't, it's just all, like, little stuff that I just thought was interesting. So when I saw that that, that uh, Courtney had an opportunity, and it's, I was most interested in the stuff dealing with macroinvertebrates, I was like, hey, yeah, this sounds like something I'd be interested in. So I just sent her an email. What particular macroinvertebrates do you guys look at? Uh, I've only come across, like, a select few in leafler samples, mostly stoneflies, mainflies. Mayflies, caddisflies, but I think it's interesting because you just kind of look through and you, you never really know what you're going to find, but I think they're just all really cool in general because it's just crazy how, like, organisms like that just can exist in, like, underwater and leaf litter. Like, you just never think that that'd be really an ecosystem where you could find a community of animals. Have you had a chance to go out yourself to go and collect some of this litter 
this leaf litter with Courtney? No, I haven't. It's unfortunate. When uh, At the end of the spring semester, I had just come back from a study abroad, and I had a plethora of free time because the university spring semester was still ongoing. However, mine had just ended. So I was in the lab with Courtney, I would say, uh, every day. I mean, every other day of the week. And I, I was like, it was really cool and stuff, but then when she was had the opportunity to take out leaflet samples, I believe I missed that because I actually had a job come up this semester, and now I'm, like, never available, so it's really unfortunate. But I'd really love the opportunity to do that. That sounds really fun. How long have you been working in the lab with Courtney? Just just over a month, I'd say. Nice. You've only been in the lab for a month, but it seems like you've learned a lot. What do you hope to learn? Like, do you hope to have your own project? Uh, well, mainly, Courtney's been trying to help me work through identifying the macroinvertebrates through, like, dichotomous keys, which is just basically, like, oh, does it have this? Then go to step this. Does it have this? Basically, and I really hope to kind of be versed in my macroinvertebrates because I feel like that'd be a really cool skill to have, especially in my field. As far as it goes to my own research or, like, my own lab, I feel like I'm not necessarily, like, comfortable forming up my own hypothesis yet. I feel like I need to know more try to figure out really what I want to look at. And I feel like working with Courtney and working at these other labs in my job are just, I feel like it could really help me figure out what I really want to do. Well, you said labs like plural. You're working oh. in another lab too? Yeah. my uh, The job I work at this summer, I'm a lab technician for Dr. Jean Sow. She deals with ticks and Lyme disease in Michigan. So I... In this lab, I, I, for example, I'm going out tomorrow, and we're going to the eastern upper peninsula, and we go out and we take these, uh, like, cloths, and they're attached to, like, a, a pole and a string on both ends, and you drag them through, like, leaf litter and underbrush in efforts to, uh, like, catch ticks. And the whole goal of this lab is to try to figure out, like, the course and the, the basically how far Lyme disease is spreading across the state of Michigan, because if you guys haven't really figured up, or not figured up, but they haven't really been informed, but Lyme disease and ticks are relatively new to the state of Michigan. They're kind of coming in from the west. So I, this is also, I was also interested in this lab because it dealt with, like, kind of, like, cool insect, not insect, but arachnids, ticks. I thought it would be, like, really cool animals, really cool disease vectored as well. I really like, I really like the way diseases are portrayed in the environment. Like, I feel like, um... I'm just really interested in the way, like, diseases work and their place in the environment because I feel like a lot of people just view them more as, like, a problem or something to be destroyed rather than another organism in the environment as opposed to, like, like, a, like you see a panda bear for, like, the World Wildlife Foundation. But you wouldn't, if you put, like, a disease on there, like, no one would ever give them money, you know? Like, I don't know. I'm sorry if I just kind of went off there, but... No, I get what you're saying. That's really cool. You're working at two labs at once. Do you think that you're going to stay in both labs at the end of the summer, or are you going to go back to Courtney's lab um, solely? Well, I I hope to run the, the tick lab as long as it they need me. I don't want to, like, drop out if I – like, if I have the time, I'd, I'd rather work in both labs. However, if one lab ends prematurely, then, yeah, of course. But as far as I'm concerned, I'm, I'm willing to work in both labs for the duration of the summer. I, I feel like that's what I really wanted to spend the summer on less – of, like, relaxed time or trying to, like, figure out what I want to do. And I really hope to figure that out in both these labs. And if I can add to that, I, as a mentor, I think it's wonderful that he's working in two labs and is getting this awesome experience with a really big lab, with a large field experience this summer, where we can do more um, smaller one-on-one -on -one mentoring with the identification at other times. And so I think they're very complementary experiences that I'm glad he gets to enjoy. Do you both ever sit down and kind of try to manage your time and when you are going to meet and plan all your experiments? Um, it's been really kind of shoddy lately. My availability has become sporadic because of this tick lab job. There's really no, like, schedule. It's not like I, I come in, like, Monday 8 a.m., leave Friday or leave at not or five in the afternoon or anything. It's basically it's it's I I'll tell you what I'm about to do tomorrow. I'm about to leave for the upper peninsula and then I'll be gone until Friday because I'll be up there hitting site and site and site, camping, site, site, site. So it's if if I were to come back to East Lansing every day, I would try to find a time where I'd be available. 
for example, like this past weekend, I was able to come in on Saturday. But that's because like I was gone this entire week, and I was just me and Courtney were just trying to find a time where I could come in. And I, my only regret about taking this second lab job is that I couldn't be in Courtney's lab more because I just feel like I kind of dropped off the face of the earth. But well, it's nice that Courtney's so understanding. Yeah, it really is. I really appreciate her for that. So, Courtney, what has your experience been? mentoring a new undergraduate student to the laboratory. I really love taking on undergraduate mentors because they bring on such a exciting energy. I can tell how passionate Michael is about invertebrates and how excited he is to learn about different structures and looking at them under microscopes. Um, what's awesome about working with them is that everything is new and exciting. And so one example is that Michael was looking through leaf packs and was like, what are these, what are these sticks? What are these sticks? And I go, well, that's a caddisfly case. And he could not believe that these caddisflies lived inside this huge tube of sticks and rocks. And it was really intricate and beautiful. And so showing him that for the first time was really exciting. And now I can't wait for him to see one that's actually alive and not preserved. Whenever they're alive, aren't you worried that it's going to get on you and like under your skin or something? Because I'd be freaking out. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and say that working in this tick lab has really made me not phased by stuff on me because I've literally like been in the car and I've like seen like ticks crawling on me. And like despite the risk that they pose to my health, I'm just like, like whatever. <laughs> like, I, as a kid, I, I totally would have like, I, I was afraid of butterflies as a kid. Like, Anything creepy crawly would freak me out, but I feel like working closer with these animals or, like, trying to understand how they work and not just being, like, ignorant to, like, their nature, I feel like I've really become comfortable with, like, handling them. Or not necessarily handling them, but, like, being around them. What have you learned in these labs that you would be able to apply to the other lab, vice versa? I suppose mainly it's just kind of working in a laboratory setting, I would say. Or working with other people, I feel like when you're in like a university lab or anything, it's you never really get to feel how it is in like an actual research lab. Like for example, in like a university lab, you'd mostly like the peer of lab partners are people who are just there for like just getting the credit, or they're just there to show up. But I feel like in a research lab, people are more, for the lack of a better word, like into their work. They're more focused and everything, and they have they're more interested. I should say. So just to clarify, when you mean a university lab, you mean like... Uh, like if I were to take like BS-161, Bio-1, or Chem-141, or not 141, but the like Chem-161 lab. like Gotcha. Like, n- nothing against those classes. They teach you valuable skills. They teach yeah, you valuable we, skills. we get that. It's, it's a difference between a class and people getting paid to do the research. Yeah, exactly. What year are you in? Are you a sophomore, junior, senior? I am going into my senior year. Nice. And what do you hope to do whenever you graduate? Do you have an idea yet? I'm I'm not exactly sure. Like I feel like this summer is like I said, it's hopefully like me trying to figure out a lot of stuff. Uh I've been trying to look into graduate opportunities, but more of like having like the school pay for my graduate stuff and that I know that requires a whole lot of work, but I don't wanna just dive into graduate school and pay for it if like I don't really have to, you know. And that's just stuff I need to figure out and I really hope I really figure that out this summer. And I would agree that that is a thought that a lot of undergraduates here at Michigan State University are constantly thinking about when they're preparing for uh, life after their undergraduate career. Seems like you're pretty busy this summer, you know, being in two labs and whatnot, but what do you do in spare time? Like, are you involved in anything on campus? Yeah, I'm I'm actually part of the Impact uh, radio station right here. I'm part of the content team, and this... I also, like I said, I was in a study abroad this past semester, so I wasn't too involved. But the past few years, I've been really trying to work on. They have like these, like these little articles they call like Jam of the Days, or they'll do like a Throwback Thursday Jam of the Day, and I like to write those mostly because like I'll be listening to like a song, and I'll just like get stuck in my head, and I just like to like just totally write like a few paragraphs about it or something. And I've, and I've actually gotten like people on the Impact website to be like, whoa, like cool article i'm not exactly sure who these people are i don't know if they're just paid to do that or anything but i just think i don't know it's just really cool stuff i'd like to get more involved in the impact honestly but i just hope that's something i can do in this upcoming fall semester 
Perfect. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, of course. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. Thanks, yeah. Michael. And thanks, Courtney. Thank you to all of our listeners for tuning in. And remember, the truth is in the science. If you're a current or visiting undergraduate student that would like to be interviewed with your graduate student mentor, please reach out to us at scifiles at impact89fm.org. See you next week on The Sci-Files.